Hi everyone, uh, my name is Thomas. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the Maison Creek taphonomy and I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of paleogeography because I think that's something that we don't particularly look at as paleontologists. So uh, the Maison Creek Lagerstätten is a 300 million year old uh, fossil bed uh, in Illinois. It's found just to the southwest of Chicago and it's famous for its beautiful uh, siderite concretions. So these are iron carbonate and they preserve a huge range of organisms, uh, lots of invertebrates and lots of vertebrates, and they have great fidelity of soft tissues. So uh, we get lots of morphological characters, loads of information, and in this fish, for example, we get beautiful uh, pigment uh, that is still preserved. Uh, we also get lots of really cool beasts uh, that I'm really interested in, uh, things like uh, fossil lampreys and fossil hagfish. Um, but these have caused a little bit of uh, uh, Controversy is a bit of a strong word, but people have, have debated about some of their morphological characters, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why. So one thing that's really interesting about the Maison Creek is there are lots of contemporaneous carboniferous sideritic Lagerstätten around the world. But it's, uh, the Maison Creek, not only does it preserve uh, the most variety of organisms, but I, I would argue that it probably has the highest fidelity of soft tissues and the most morphological characters uh, from those organisms that are preserved. I'm sure some people might argue with me, Vincent. But uh, so uh, I'm really interested in why the Maison Creek is specific, uh, is preserving that so well. And to do that, uh, I'm really interested uh, in using taphonomy and understanding the fossilization processes, which we can do by looking at the fossils, but we can also do uh, using experiments as well. And one reason why this is really important is something that I've been involved in is debates about enigmatic organisms like the Tully monster. And that's really important because people are arguing about whether characters are present or absent. But yet, I don't think that, that most of these papers that have been working on this have a really good uh, constrained taphonomic model and really understand what's happening in the Maison Creek and specifically what's happening to different tissue types. So that was something I wanted to try and address. So when it comes to creating taphonomic models, there, there has been a little bit of a pushback recently where this idea that may, maybe creating an overarching taphonomic model doesn't work because of this idea of variance in fossils. So here's a little cartoon that I knocked up just showing some examples of what different uh, fossils of the same uh, organism look like from the Maison Creek. And you get a huge variety of characters that are present, uh, some that are absent, and sometimes you get completely barren concretions. And this has caused a big problem when trying to understand how these things preserve. And we see that there's a really nice example that was published not so long ago about an elasmobranch shark called Bandringa rei. And you can see that these two uh, fossils show significant difference in the mode of preservation, even though they're from one site. And that was uh, originally po there was po uh, postulated that it could be because one was preserved in an area that was uh, thought to be marine and one was th preserved in an area that was thought to be freshwater. And this could be the difference. But uh, over the course of my PhD and the last couple of years, I've been, I've been working really hard at looking at the, all of the geological signals, uh, sedimentology, but also looking at the, the concretions and the biota themselves. And this idea of a freshwater and marine divide doesn't actually hold up uh, and doesn't exist. We, we published a review on this not so long ago. It's actually a marine basin that you have freshwater organisms that wash out into. Um, and so uh, I don't think that there's a strong evidence to suggest that there are, there's this environmental difference causing this variation in preservation. So something else must be happening. So the question is then, if preservation is random and, you, and each fossil has its own unique taphonomic story, you know, can you create a taphonomic model? And then the other question is, where are morphological characters that we would expect to see uh, based on experimental decay? And one example that is often used is the notochords. So in the lampreys and the hagfish that I showed earlier, they don't preserve notochords, yet we know from experimental decay of those animals that the notochords tend to persist for a very long time. So where are those characters? So I created a, a taphonoid model. This is actually based on work that was done in the 80s, and we've sort of uh, just sort of filled it out a little bit uh, using uh, larger data sets. But it's a, it's a pretty standard model of an organism gets buried rather rapidly. Um, it then creates a microenvironment when it starts to decay because the decay juices can't escape from the sediment. That is geochemically different from the sediment. And so you start to get lots of interesting things when the bacteria start to break down products. And once they deplete all the sulfate, uh, you start to get iron carbonate uh, precipitating in areas where uh, you have super saturated with iron, which uh, obviously was the case in the Maison Creek. And then that, that then uh, lithifies into this concretion and uh, you get uh, the fossil as we see it today. But that still doesn't really answer this uh, question of, of where the variance is. 
So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at motor preservation across the entirety of the Maison Creek and see if it was consistent and see if we could come up with a model. So I looked at all of the major animal groups that are preserved in the Maison Creek and we found some really uh, interesting trends. So we found that most organisms that preserve soft tissues uh, consistently preserve them as this sort of white stain on the matrix. And when we looked at that underneath the SEM, what we found was that was just elevated areas of kaolinite. Uh, sometimes it has very little background difference from the actual matrix itself. And then uh, when we looked at the actual external organics of the or these organisms, what we found is they were almost always moldic. There was very little actual organic material left in the Maison Creek. When we looked for uh, organic tissues being preserved, what we found was really interesting. So in the ostracods and bacopods, we do get some phosphatic shells uh, that persist. But actually, all the other organisms are just preserving in this stain, except for the vertebrates, which have these uh, pigmented areas. So things like eye spots and lateral lines, and some have uh, camouflage that are still, that are still uh, preserved. And then when we looked for unequivocal internal tissues, the only things that we could find were uh, uh, phosphatized bone and skeletal remains. We couldn't find any other un un but we couldn't find any other internal tissues that were unequivocal. So that's really interesting and has led to our hypothesis that actually in the Maison Creek, what it is you're seeing is external templating of the soft tissues um, by clay. And this is something which has been described previously in the places like the Herefordshire. So when the organism has died, it has a different electrochemical uh, static. Um, it's, it's different from static for the clay. And the clays flocculate to the outside of it and, and basically template around it. And we do get some phosphatized internal tissues and then the pigments persist. So that's why you don't see things like notochords because we're actually having external preservation, even though some of these organisms uh, look like they're preserving the internal anatomy. And then uh, I think what makes it really difficult in the Maison Creek is you have this uh, incredible diagenetic overprint. So you often get remobilization of kaolinites, which can really skew characters and make it really difficult to do this kind of work. So untangling that has been a bit of a difficulty. But the variance and the reason why we see such variance, uh, we've answered that by looking at fossil polychaetes. So we've looked at over 300 uh, specimens. And what we did is we, we catalogued their characters and we compared those to uh, our decay experiments. And, and what our data suggests is that the reason why we see such variance is because that the different, uh, the organisms are undergoing varying amounts of decay prior to the formation of the concretion. And that basically removes certain morphological characters and that's why we see this variance. Um, and that's a, a talk that I presented, I think, last year or the year before. But something else that's really interesting about the Maison Creek that, like I wanted to talk about, is paleogeography. So the traditional collecting area from the Maison Creek is only a few square kilometers. Uh, they've built a nuclear power station on it now, so it's quite difficult to get there. But actually, it spans several hundred square kilometers. And we were able to collect data uh, by combining some work that was done in the 80s with some of our recent work and going out and doing field work. And we can create a basic model for the Maison Creek where you move away from uh, the uh, sedimentary source. And as you move away from the sedimentary source, obviously depositional rate and mineral abundance decreases. And that has some really interesting effects. So uh, based on a huge data set of concretions that was collected in the 80s, and we've added to that, we found that the closer you are to uh, the uh, sedimentary source, the higher percentage of uh, fossils to uh, barren concretions. And as you move away, there's a much lower uh, percentage of fossiliferous concretions to dud concretions. And we think that's basically because the, as you move further away from the sedimentary source, you're taking longer to be buried. Uh, there's less minerals abundant for the uh, bacteria to start uh, these uh, concretions to be formed, and basically decay is happening uh, for longer periods of time prior to fossilization. So uh, this is a, just a little cartoon. Uh, you can see that uh, bioturbation in small areas also has a dramatic effect and almost completely wipes out because the bacteria are mixing in sulfate and that actually poisons uh, the precipitation of siderite. But yes, you can see as you move away, uh, you get an increase in barren concretions, and then you move away into completely non-concretionary fasces. So in conclusion, uh, variation and preservation in the Maison Creek is an interplay between burial speed, decay, and mineral abundance. Uh, but it does conform to what we see in experimental models, and it is predictable. So I would argue that we can create an overarching taphonomic model for the Maison Creek. So I'd just like to say thank you to my supervisors, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. <laughs>